It is my pleasure to welcome you to the fourth and final uh, faculty pub night for fall 2013. Um, tonight we are honored to have as our speaker Professor Antonia Darder. Um, and I'm give, going to give you a brief introduction about her. Um, she who needs no introduction to all of you, I'm sure, but um, just so that we all have this information. Professor Antonia Darder completed her undergraduate work at Cal State Long, Los Angeles, her master's at Pacific Oaks College, and her doctorate in philosophy of education from Claremont Graduate University. Professor Darder is an internationally recognized Farian scholar. She holds the Levy Presidential Chair of Ethics and Moral Leadership here at LMU. For more than 30 years, her practice and scholarship have focused on political questions and ethical concerns linked to racism, class inequalities, language rights, critical pedagogy, Latino education, and social justice. Beyond her scholarly efforts, Dr. Darder has been an activist participating in a variety of efforts tied to educational rights, workers' rights, bilingual education, women's issues, environmental justice, and immigrant rights. In 2005, she established a radio collective with students and community members who produced Liberacion, a public affairs radio program on WEFT radio in Champaign, Illinois. As a member of the Champaign-Urbana Independent Media Center, she was active as a community journalist with the public eye. In 2007, she worked with graduate students on an award-winning documentary, Breaking Silence, The Pervasiveness of Oppression, that examined the persistence of inequality at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. The way that was regionally written, it said, at the university, and I didn't want anyone to think we meant this one. <laughs> <laughs> at that university. <laughs> Dr. Darder is an established poet who began writing and reciting her poetry in the community, as a result of her participation in the L.A. Barrio Writers Workshop led by the late Manzanar Gamboa and Luis Rodriguez. Dr. Darder is an established visual artist. She was first inspired in the early 1980s when she visited the Frida Kahlo Museum in Mexico, La Casa Azul. Since then, her work has displayed a variety of themes including political struggle, family, nature, spirituality, and love. More recently, her work has sought to articulate a critical theory of leadership for social justice and community engagement, as well as a, to theorize a pedagogy of beauty in the pursuit of a liberatory practice of education. Dr. Darder's work has been deeply influenced by the world-renowned Brazilian educator and philosopher Paulo Freire, whose ideas profoundly influenced the direction of her life work. Tonight, Dr. Darder will be speaking to us about her book, Culture and Power in the Classroom, Educational Foundations for the Schooling of Bicultural Students, which was recently published in a new and expanded second edition um, in honor of the 20th anniversary of the first edition. So without further ado, Dr. Darder. All right, if you've heard me speak before, this is going to be a little bit different. Usually I'm very, you know, the, the PowerPoints now and, and, you know, the whole thing to set up. And this time I decided, is this supposed to be a pub night? <laughs> I mean, like, where's the beer? I mean, I thought we were going to, like, throw the darts, you know, and, and it's just kind of jazz. So, um, so in some ways it's very good that I left my folder with my notes, <laughs> so then it really forced me to have to be extemporaneous, and and it, and that's fine because actually what I what I thought I would do is just spend a, a, a few minutes talking to you a little bit about the book and how it came about, <clears throat> and I think that that there will be enough material in that that then we can kind of have a dialogue together about maybe some questions and some thoughts and some issues that might be important to you that you might want to ask about or you might just want to engage um, in, in, in conversation about. So the first thing, the book is, this particular edition is a 20th anniversary edition. I can't even believe that it's, it was, in 1991 is when the book came out. This was actually um, the translation of my dissertation <clears throat> to, to the, the book manuscript. Um, and the book itself, the, the, my, my work, my, my doctoral work, I think I need to start there 
because when I got into graduate school, I think a lot of the issues that were kind of rolling around for me is, what was I doing there? <laughs> because for the longest time, it was like, what was I doing there? And believe me, that didn't go away for a long, long time. I think I, I must have been 10 years already, you know, had already become a senior professor. I was still asked, and even today, I think I posted something <laughs> in Facebook about, you know, my, my struggle around academic life and the mental life, the, the way it gets mentalized at times when there's so much work to be done. And for many of us that are radical scholars, that are um, scholars who are committed to the transformation of consciousness, transformation of society, the, the issue is that it's not just about words or about writing in a book. It's about how do we take our ideas and how do we engage with, with others and how do we engage in a kind of labor that allows some kind of transformative processes to take place. And of course, the hardest thing about that is, a, is that we're engaging with a deeply hegemonic society. So we're de dealing with a society where power relationships are such and material conditions are such that actually really constantly push against the possibility of democratic life. And that's the reality of it. I and mean, we try to create what, how we can, we try to create spaces to, to allow democratic moments, right, to exist, or counter-hegemonic moments to exist. But the truth of the matter is, most of the time, many of us feel at a loss because we feel that we're pushing against something very deeply embedded, very deeply grounded. And that it's, on one hand, it is about issues of consciousness, but never can we think about those questions of consciousness outside of the material conditions. And there's this relationship that exists by the ways that we think and how the ways that we think produce the conditions in which we live, work, you know, dream, love, die, essentially. So what, is, what is, does all this mean to me? Well, I come out of a, a, a kind of interesting history in the sense that I was born in Puerto Rico, and I was born in Puerto Rico in the early 50s. In the early 50s, and what was happening in, in Puerto Rico was that Operation Bootstrap had really taken off in the island. And a lot of what was going on was trying to kind of to mobilize Puerto Rico in order to provide a certain kind of economic uh, support. And but also, you know, it, it, it had a very strategic place in terms of Latin America and during that, that time. But, but a couple of the, the elements of Operation Bootstrap had to do with the moving of Puerto Ricans off the island to places in the United States where they needed workers. So the, the, you know, the mills, um, so many of them were going to, of course, New York, which most people think about Puerto Ricans in New York at that time. But they were also going to like Lowell, Massachusetts, that people don't think about. You know, they were going to different parts of going to parts of outside of Boston. They were going to Chicago to work in the meat factories and, uh, and other factories in, in, in that area. And then a small contingent would end up in California. And when they end up in California, they just could not deal with the cold. <laughs> so it's, you know, it was, I mean, you're going to think, we're, we're Caribbeans, right? <laughs> and we like the, the sun, we like the sun, we like the heat. And so suddenly there we were, you know, transported to, to coal. And actually, my mother ended up in, in, in Chicago. But part of what went on in, during that time was then there were access that were created to get Puerto Ricans to move. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of a mobility. So there were like, you could get inexpensive tickets off the island if you were going to a place that needed labor. <clears throat> The other part of the policy was the sterilization of Puerto Rican women because it was decided that part of the problem of the island is that it was overpopulated. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> that if we started sterilizing the women, the women were sterilized, that that was going to help, you know, in terms of taking care of that problem. And the, the, the issue is that, the, that it persists in, in interesting kinds of ways. It talk about how public policy can actually become embedded into the very culture of the people. So now in Puerto Rico, it is very, very common for women to talk about la operación. La operación is just, you know, it's like, oh, creo que van a hacer la operación. You know, it, it, it's just part of, of, you know, everyday life. 
But women think about sterilization just as a commonplace thing. By the time that the 60s rolled around, many people don't know that over 35% of Puerto Rican women had been sterilized as a consequence of that particular policy on the island. So the reason that I bring that up and, and how it's connected to this is that, that it, for me, it's been an important piece to understand that each one of us, and in working with my students, this is something that I, I really try very hard to impress on them, each of us are receptacles of history, in a sense. Each of us, we carry our histories in our bodies. We carry our histories in, in, in who we are. And we don't, we're ne not necessarily taught to think of ourselves as subjects of history. And of course, for Paulo Freire, so much of his work was around how did we create a pedagogy within classrooms that, we, that were in fact about articulating the sense of subjecthood of history in terms of students, how students could begin to see themselves as subjects of history, right? Rather than seeing themselves as simply objects of society particularly if they were students who were coming from oppressed communities, disenfranchised communities. <clears throat> so for me, it was important to understand how that particular, that particular public policy, and it gave me this intimate understanding that public policy, although often students think of public policy as way out there, <laughs> there's no sense that the public policies that are being made actually have some very direct implications on people's lives. And so for me, by understanding how it had a direct implication on my life, from the standpoint, for example, that I end up growing up in East Los Angeles, mm -hmm. rather than growing up you know, in Bayamón or, or in Arecibo or in Vega Baja, where I was born, <laughs> and, and where, my, uh, where some of my family still lives, which would have created. I mean, if you think about it, for all of us, it's not, it's not that I think this is so unique, but that often we're not taught to think of ourselves in these historical ways. And so the consequence history gets taught, thought about simply as, as this script or this text that we read in a book, or these events that happen somewhere out there, or a history of the privileged, you know, the ones who won the battles kind of things, but the histories of, of just the regular folk and especially disenfranchised folks, are seldom seen as actual terrains of struggle and actual terrains of possibility. And so for me, a lot of my, my life has been that. So I end up in, I, I, we end up in, in, in uh, California. And the interesting thing is we end up in California because my grandmother hooked up with an, <laughs> an army guy who was stationed in Puerto Rico. I mean, you know, just the ways that our lives move, right? And so they got married, and she ended up in, in California. So my mother goes to Chicago, and after slipping a couple of times, you know, on the snow, just said, oh, no. Olvídalo esto, no. And so she found a way to get herself, you know, with the help of my grandmother, to California. And so we ended up in Los Angeles and ended up growing up in East LA, which is a very kind of interesting thing because, of course, I'm Puerto Rican, which is you know, Caribbean, <laughs> different than Mexicanos. And so there's this kind of tension that happens you know, between Puerto Ricanos and Mexicanos because we have a different history, but people lump us all together because we're all Latinos kind of thing. And you know, there's kind of that, that kind, of, kind of element. But we speak Spanish. So the interesting thing is that it's an interesting way in which language then, even though you know, our, our Spanish can be a little bit different in terms of some of the words are different, and even some of the cadences and how, how people speak. It's just like, you know, in the U.S., if you go to the South, you know, people talk, talk a certain way, right? You know, they draw them. <laughs> Or you go to the north, you know, or you know, in Harvard. I remember when I, I, I was in, I had to go to <clears throat> to speak at Harvard. I had I hadn't been to, hadn't been to to uh, uh, Boston, and and, we, and the woman say to me, okay, you know, you take you take the T to Harvard Square, <laughs> Harvard Square, and I'm like, how do you spell that? <laughs> I was embarrassed, <laughs> but it was because I wasn't used to hearing that way of. Saying Harvard, 
Well, it's the same thing in Spanish. So, you know, so the consequence, people would know that I, you know, by the way that I inflected and the way I spoke, that I was not Chicana, Americana, that I was Puerto Rican. But, you know, human beings are very interesting because, you know, we adapt and we struggle and we kind of work. So with time, I learned to speak <laughs> like Mexicanos. You know, I mean, my friends were, were, were Chicano, Mexicanos, and, and we begin to share and move the language back and forth more that way, of course, because it was a large community, and I was in that community. My growing up has a lot to do with this book, and it has a lot to do in the sense that I grew up enormously poor. So I grew up very, very poor. My mother was either, you know, on welfare or working on Los Angeles Street and Santi in the in the garment district, if any of you know the garment district. I and mean, that's that was our life. Our life would go back from you know, back and forth, depending on how she was feeling or what was happening to her. Because my mother was a smart woman. But in, incredibly, I mean, feeling the oppression of poverty. A very smart woman living in very, very impoverished conditions, struggling and trying to figure out how to make her way um, through the world with these two kids. And we were, you know, kind of come out of a, of a life where we were constantly living in rooms and. You know, I mean, my, and then my mother and my, my grandmother was crazy. I mean, my grandmother got us out here, but then we couldn't stand each other because they were all, you know, just the craziness of families and the craziness, I think, about the way that inequality and the way that racism works on people's lives. And we think, you know, there's an idea in the West, especially in terms of psychology, that if you are a strong person, that if you are a healthy person, you ought to be able to be in any condition. And you should be just fine. You know, that, you, that, that part of what, what makes you healthy is that you are not affected by the conditions around you. I cannot tell you how crazy that view of the world is <laughs> when somebody comes out of my life. <laughs> and I want to say, okay, you, you very, you know, I, I'm sure you have to be somewhat affluent to go up with that. <laughs> so let me put you in my conditions and let me see just how well you are going to do, you know, let's, let's, let's see how, how healthy you're going to end up. Because it's a very interesting thing how class works, how racism and class formation and class struggle is always at work in our lives in ways that are not engaged and in very, I mean, there are very real intimate ways. Many of us may be theorists and we may be talking about, you know, social class or speaking about, you know, <clears throat> issues of racism, and we often speak of them at times in ways that are disembodied, even those of us that have lived them. And so for me, so much of the work was about how could I speak about these issues in embodied ways, in ways that created a kind of theory <clears throat> that was a theory that was informed by the practice of living and surviving inequality, living and surviving poverty. I went to very, very poor schools, um, but my teachers, I had teachers, interestingly enough, who were important to me. I remember Mrs. Lewis, an African-American woman who was my first grade teacher, and Mrs. Lewis took me under her, kind of like, for whatever reason, she liked me, and I liked her. <laughs> and I felt loved by her. Not only like, I felt loved by her. And you know, that was very, very important for a very poor child living in the conditions that were very, very unstable and very, very difficult because of the structural realities of what was the 50s for very poor people in East Los Angeles. <clears throat> and so her impact on my young, tender mind <laughs> and, and being was to the point that it, it remains with me. And then later on, I go on, and I, you know, I feel after I leave her classroom, it's like I'm always looking for, for Mrs. Lewis, in a sense. And that's not what I'm getting. It's interesting. But I, I, I'll make all of this, just, just bear with me. Go on this little journey with me. <laughs> Don't worry. It, it comes together. <laughs> and, and I continue, and then again, I'm in fourth grade, and there I have Mr. Vidito. 
And Mr. Vitito is from Trinidad. And Mr. Vitito is somebody who I, he's Caribbean, and he's somebody that I can relate to, that I feel safe with, that I feel heard by. And, all, and what these experiences do is they stay with me in such a way that it continues, even after all these years, to give me a sense of part of the needs that young children have in order to be heard, to feel recognized, to feel a sense of tenderness about who they are, and that all children need that. And that unfortunately, that when we go into very impoverished schools, Often the conditions are such, and this may be in many schools, but in particularly in poverty schools, where there is such level of stress in terms of the teaching conditions themselves, that often it is difficult to see teachers be able to transmit that kind of love, that kind of intimacy, that kind of what Paolo Freire would call love, that sense of love in terms of the work. And he would, he would say that, you know, what allows a teacher to continue, you know, keep trying, even if that student doesn't get it, even if that student is just not responding, you just keep on, and if you, if you keep on a thousand times, you just keep on. Because what allows you to keep keeping on is that love, that sense of love, that sense of love for humanity, and that sense of you understand your vocation as a teacher is not just about teaching subject matter, but it is about, in fact, engaging with a human being. And that through that process of engagement, children are learning as much in those relationships as they are learning in terms of the subject matter itself. And that is one of the elements that seems so gone in many ways, so just you know, in, in, in our very evidence-based driven education and our testing, you know, the mania of testing kids and thinking that's how we understand whether kids are in fact uh, achieving or not. Uh, we, we see a very interesting way in which positivism comes into play in education in ways that truly makes objects out of students. And their sense of humanity is slowly but surely stripped away. And as the older the students get, the more objectified they become. And they themselves are not necessarily aware of that objectification or the alienation that is going on in the way they're being taught. But often they do know that something isn't right. I mean, it's an interesting thing when you talk to young people and, and the way that they tell you their story about education. So all of those pieces come together in that I begin, you know, I, I, I continued through my life. I got married very young. I got married at 16 years old. And it was a way to, you know, it was a way to stay. <laughs> I mean, it, it's the truth. I mean, it was just crazy. And so getting married was going to be the easiest thing, so I get married, and by the time I'm 20, I have three kids. And, but you know what? See, this is the interesting thing. I mean, we don't realize how, how engendered we are in a particular class way of looking at life. We don't, because for me, it was the best thing that happened to me. Having those children was the best thing that happened to me in the sense that those children in many ways, if I had not had them, they would not, I wouldn't have had the kind of grounding and purpose that permitted me then to continue the struggle to go through an education and to get an education. So that education was not just about for me, it was for them and for the children that would come and for my community. And so it's very, very interesting how how we're taught to think formulaic about human experiences. And so as a consequence, because we create these formulas about how we think and interpret human experience, we often find ourselves having a very, very difficult time actually being able to hear and see and know who people really are. And sometimes people become so fixated in their story about somebody else that you yourself, and I'm sure that 
I would bet that there's nobody in this room who has not had somebody fixate on a story about you that you know is not true, but there's not a damn thing you can do about it, but wait it out and hope that at some point the person's going to wake up out of this story and they're not going to need to make you the villain anymore or make you the idiot anymore or make you what, the ogre or whatever it is. But the reality that these are ways of being in the world that have a lot to do with the way that children are educated, objectified, and then how they learn to objectify themselves and each other. And so for me, the struggle was so much. When I came across Paulo Freire's work, it was significant for me, for it was the first time that I had heard an educational theorist that spoke right out there about love and that talked about love as our vocation, that talked about false generosity, that spoke about the needs of the oppressed, that understood that if you were going to serve people who were disenfranchised, you had to understand that you had to come to it from the standpoint that what folks are living, not what you imagine folks to be living, but what they, in fact, are living. And so that meant that the only way you could do that effectively is if you did it with the people. How you engage with the people. And so it meant that you had to be a different kind of educator. And you had to think of yourself, rather than seeing yourself as kind of the epitome of knowledge, you had to begin to understand knowledge as beyond these kind of prescriptive memorizations or you know theoretical formulations, but that knowledge was also about the knowledge that we construct in community and in relationship together. And so, so much of what he what he spoke about for me, it was like this. It was like it spoke to me. You know, the sins, I didn't have to ask it like, how do you define the press? And it's very, very interesting when people read Paulo Freire's book, <laughs> because they don't realize that their response to it is often is very, very class-based. You know, if they not experience oppression or any sense of connection with people who have been oppressed or any sense of, of social struggle, they, they get all entangled in the words of the book. Whereas when students <laughs> who come from you know, very difficult conditions, have had very harsh lives, read the book, it is always amazing to me, having taught it now for 30-something years, right? How different they respond to it. And how much work I have to do to try to get folks who don't come from that kind of a context to sit back and to imagine, it's okay, imagine that you're limited. You're limited because your experience has limited you in terms of this particular area, not in other areas. Now, that becomes very difficult in an educational system where people are taught that if you don't know something, you're stupid. Or if you don't know something, if you do not know, is in a sense almost a crime, a sin. Like you should feel shame to not know something. So the, 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 the issue is that when you believe that knowledge is partial, and Freddie off, off always spoke about this, said all of us, every single one of us, knowledge is partial. We, you know, we have partial knowledge. In fact, why is solidarity so important in struggle, and why is solidarity so important in relationship to life? It's because we can't know it all. No one person can know it all. And that we actually need each other in order to evolve and to grow in terms of consciousness, but to evolve as societies, as truly humanizing societies. So for Paulo Freire, education was to be a vehicle, a humanizing vehicle. Very, very different than what we find at work in traditional schools today. And partly is because there's a way in which the integral understanding of the human being is taken away and the emphasis is put on cognition. And there's no sense that when you keep focusing on cognition, you're going to socialize beings who are out of balance. And there's no sense about why do we have, I mean, why do so many people have to take sleeping pills to sleep? You know, why is there so much stress in the world? 
there, there's no sense about our own responsibility within the context of education to one extent or another fueling the problematic nature <laughs> that we confront each day out in the world in beginning with our own I want to say beginning with our own one of the, the, the major pieces in terms of this work is, is how do educators become more self-vigilant about their behaviors, their response, or stereotypical behaviors, stereotypical responses, especially to those who are disenfranchised. What are the ways in which youth of color are criminalized? What are the ways in which um, students are perceived as deficient? Deficient because their area of knowing, their knowledge base, even neurologically, their neurological base for learning is in another, in another place than the mainstream. And so the issue, one of the, the, the new pieces in this book is looking at neuroscience. And in a sense, when I started reading a lot of the elements in terms of neuroscience, the issue of synaptic connections and the ways in which, in which you know, how we, how we learn and how we experience and how we think, what I began to realize that actually neuroscience was reinforcing what so many of us had been talking about with respect to a culturally responsive pedagogy. Because what it was doing, a culturally responsive pedagogy, what it did is it created enough familiarity for students to be able then to create new synaptic connections from which then to evolve. If, in fact, you don't engage the familiar place, if you don't come to the child engaging that some elements that are familiar to them from which they can build new connections, what you do is you leave them, in essence, to have to do twice the work. So then people wonder, why are these kids struggling in terms of you know, academic achievement, the academic achievement gap? You know, it's the education gap. It's a gap in our willingness to suspend with the, you know, the, we, we have this disbelief that maybe there isn't, you know, there's, there, there could possibly be many ways of making sense of the world, epistemologically, ontologically, cosmologically. And so what, I'm, what I was trying to figure out is how could we begin a conversation? How could we begin a conversation beyond just the ways, at the time that I wrote this, of course, and some of you will remember, is that people were talking about culture as if it was like a recipe. Okay, so, you know, how do you know? Just, just tell me how, you know, black folks are. <laughs> you know, oh, you know, tell me the things they like and tell me how they are. Tell me how, you know, how Mexican people are. <laughs> oh, they like big families. All right. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it was almost what it had to do is give me the formula so I can feel more comfortable and so that I can believe that I know who these people are, even when I don't ask them anything because I have had little experience in engaging certain communities. So I wanted to think about how could we have a dialogue that, that that in a sense pushed against that, that kind of objectification, and began to say that, yes, you could talk about those cultural differences, but even within the context of cultural differences, you had to understand that there was incredible heterogeneity within cultural communities. You know, so that there wasn't cookie cutters. There wasn't like, okay, these are the African American kids that boom, 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 you know, that are coming out that way or something. And so what gave me a language to do that was critical theory, critical social theory, you know? I mean, we would have known that. <laughs> Because I would read all these other books in terms of, you know, how people talked about education, but all of them seem so stained and in, in many ways just so, um, so fixed, so reified in the way that they talked about students and the way they talked about education. When I turned to critical social theory and then I began to understand critical pedagogy as, an, as, as kind of coming out of that tradition, what it gave me, it gave me a much more contextual understanding of who we are as human beings, who we are both whether we come from communities that are affluent or whether we come from communities that are not. You know, what are, how do the economic realities, the political realities, the cultural realities, how does hegemony work within a society? ostensibly democratic society. 
How does it work to perpetuate? I mean, how can it be that we have a level of economic inequality that we have in this country if we don't have some sense of consensus to allow it to happen that way? And where do we learn to enact that consensus? We, it's part of how we're taught. The, the kind of commonsensical ideas that we're educated with, which then cause us to believe, in particular, that, for example, if you're poor, you're poor because there's something wrong with you, there's a deficit in you, you're not smart enough, and that the people that are rich are rich because they work for it. <laughs> and because, you know, they're smart, of course. And so the interesting thing, that the way that works out is that often, I've had a lot of students who have done this research in different times, you know, over the, the last two decades, They'll talk to young people who are in you know, low-income schools, who are struggling in terms of academically, and they'll say, well, what's going on? You know, like, why, why are you having trouble? What's happening here you know, in terms of your academic? And the, the amazing thing is that 75 to 80 percent of the kids, the first thing they will tell you is that, oh, I don't study enough. Um, you know, I'm just not that smart. You know, oh, uh, you know, I just don't really like that stuff. I mean, it's, it's very, very interesting, you know. And it takes a while, a while to talk to them. You have to talk to them for a while before you can get past that first layer of encrusted yeah. thoughts about who they are and you start getting into the more painful parts of frustration. Because in, in many ways, it's almost easier to, to think that there's something wrong with you after a while. You know, everybody else thinks, so you know what, I mean, how far I'm sure you'd fight. And yet, the other piece that goes with this is that often those kids that you think are such badass kids, and nobody can stand, you know, you can't stand them in your classroom, so often those are the smartest kids, because they're going to use whatever they got to resist what feels to them as a very dehumanizing reality. And so working in, and I should tell you, Working first as a pediatric nurse, one of the reasons why it was easy for me to kind of look at some of the neural, the, the work in, in neuroscience. Working as a therapist, where I also worked with parents. So looking, engaging parents, and I remember when I was doing parent education in schools, um, I was asked to do the PET program. Some of you probably did, I don't know any of you, the Parent Effectiveness Training Program. Oh, yeah. and the, Parent effectiveness training program was like, oh my God. It was like this this very, I'm sorry for the words, some people get really mad when I use it. <laughs> David Hardy, yeah, I got into it about this <laughs> because I just throw it out there. You know, kind of bougie approach to parenting <laughs> kids, which is great if you've got money to give, uh, you know, uh, allowances and you've got, you know, you've got several rooms where you could, you know, isolate your kid and you could do all this kind of stuff. It was, you know, there was no thought that. There was that this particular way of doing parent education was based under particular social conditions, material conditions, you know, cultural conditions, and they were not appropriate for the low income families that I was working with. So talk about I mean I've just been like a like this little fighter. It's just I always end up in the fights, you know, I'm gonna fight people around around these questions. So I was trying to fight around this stuff because I was saying this is culturally inappropriate. And the parents themselves, I mean and how did I find out? I found out because I started doing it, right? Of course I would translate it. <laughs> it doesn't matter me translated, it's not right, you know? And they would look at me and they'd say they would look at me like, oh, come on, really? Or they'd be like, really, like trying to figure out what the hell I was talking, excuse me, what the heck I was talking about. And in my engagement with them, I started to realize, wait a minute. You know, I mean, I was young, I was, but I, I had enough sense that something didn't feel right. And instead of ignoring that, I instead went into it. And that has been part of my pedagogy. I mean, my pedagogy, for example, when I work with graduate students around their work, what is it that they're studying? What I want them is I want them to go into that feeling. Like, what, what is it that makes you passionate? What do you care about? Because what good does it do? 
or me, if we're talking about, in, in this case, we're talking about a, a, an educational program that has to do with social justice. So you're coming in already with a sense of social justice objective. So how can, you know, you can come in and, and talk about social justice, do us a research study about social justice, and you're going to do it about something that you're going to abstract or something that, that you don't really care about? I mean, to me, that, that kind of alienation, that kind of disconnection is exactly what we have to struggle against within education. And so, in many ways, what Paolo Ferri's book, I mean, it's called Pedagogy of the Press, right? It really was about a pedagogy of love that asked us to enter into our humanity, to lose our fear of being really present with students and with one another and with ourselves. And from that place, begin to construct knowledge together. Understand that what education was about was not the memorization of knowledge or memorization of facts, but that what we, education had to be about was true, a kind of true civic citizenship at a complete different depth level than what neoliberals are talking about. You know, it wasn't just about making money or careerism. It was about how do we create a society where, in fact, we can live, thrive, and grow together. And so those, those values resonated with that, you know, that little body of kid who was just trying to figure out how to survive. Though they, they, on a very, very deep level, they resonated with me. And they continue to resonate as I worked in communities as I did community organizing, as I continued to move. And part of what I was looking at then as a therapist was that even the psychological theories, for those of you that do counseling, but the, the psychological theories were very Western-based, Eurocentric-based. And a consequence was that they took not, nothing into account about the epistemological formations of how people made sense, how they made sense of their lives, how they created meaning in terms of their lives. And that that was significant to how people reconcile psychological tensions and struggles and angers. And, and there, were, there was even a difference in how human beings express their emotions. You could go into one cultural milieu and people could be angry and nobody got totally, you know, pushed out of shape. Mm -hmm. You know, people just yell. Like, what's your community? I mean, they just, but nobody felt like, oh my God, the world's going to fall down. But just you could go into another cultural milieu and boy, if you did that, it was like, you know, everybody would be like, <laughs> either thinking how they put you, you know, send you off to the, <laughs> the psych ward or something, you know, or get you out. I mean, and, and those issues also translated into the classroom. So part of what, what, what I, the theory that came, that came out of this work, partly through my work as, as a therapist working in, in communities, was the sense that there was a way in which subordinate people who lived in a predominantly subordinate cultural position had to engage with a dominant cultural position and that that was just part and parcel of survival. You just had to survive. So how did it work? It worked that many times you shut your mouth as a coping mechanism. You're not honest with teachers. You know, you, you, know, you, you stay quiet or you're simply silenced because you feel like if you're honest about how you're responding to the subject matter, they're going to think you're weird or something because you have a different take. So I, I, I did, I, often when I do uh, a, um, a lecture on biculturalism, I use an example when I was uh, um, working in the Head Start. And the, the example was that there was, and some of you have heard this example, but I was, they, we, they used to give the Peabody test and the, you know, the baby, the baby Wexler and all, and these are psychological tests that some of them they still give. But one of them was, has four, it was a card, and it would have four pictures on it. And there would be a whole series of this, these pictures. And they give them, some of you may remember if you were just a lot, I don't know. You know, so they'd give you these pictures, and then the, the child was supposed to say how the pictures were the same. So they, a whole series of pictures. And 
And based on how the child scored, they determined the cognitive abilities of the child. Okay. So my frustration was that I was <laughs> supposed to translate. You know, so by translation, you know, okay, they make almost only iguales, you know, are they the same? And there were some cards that the Latino kids always miss. I mean, you know, it was like religion, like they always miss them. And the one that I remember the most was one where there were four, um, um, there was a doctor, there was a postman, there was a dentist, and there was, I think, a, a filling station man. Anyway, there were four, there were, and so the child was supposed to say how they were, you know, the same. And the Latino kids would always say, they help us. That would be the, that, I mean, in, they, they would say, they help us. That's how they're the same, they help us. Nos ayudan. And so, you know, of course, you're not supposed to show the kid that they, you know, that they made a mistake. You're just supposed to go on, right? But I, what was frustrating for me is that, can any of you even imagine, I mean, if you've not heard the story, what that real answer, what, what the true answer, what the correct answer is? Careers? Jobs? That's close, though. Mm -hmm. No. If they, remember, they're, five, they're, they're, they're four years old, huh? They're all guys. Oh, you got, you know this one. <laughs> that is, they're all men. The kid is supposed to be able to decipher that they're all men. Oh my God. Okay, now, if you want to understand what I mean, epistemology, in terms of epistemological differences or ontological, you know, either, I'll show you like really simple. The simple thing is that within the culture of the children, mm -hmm. Helping each other have primary, in other words, a relational, a relational way of making sense of the world was privileged. Mm -hmm. The kids in English, I mean, you don't even think about this because we don't think that our language is also imposing a cultural view. Yeah. Within English, the, the kids are socialized, or particularly with mainstream culture, the kids are socialized to be more object relation, relational. And so the object is what has privilege. Two different ways, and I'm not, I'm not saying one is wrong, or I'm saying these are two ways of making sense of the world. And so the consequence was that I would see this happening, and no matter how much I tried to explain to them, there's a problem here. This test is really culturally biased. They would say, well, you know, we've got to score them. And the kids would get scored in terms of their cognitive abilities, not their cognitive level at that time. Their cognitive abilities, it would go on their cue, and it would continue to follow them. And it would become, in essence, the beginning, sometimes, of a record that do these kids. So trying to make sense of the way that culture and power are at work then within education, within the ways in which we think about what is correct, what is what we think as you know commonsensical, speaking of it in the in the the, the manner in which Antonio Granchi's work you know introduced to us. So I just I I, I I it it made sense to me. I mean I thought it gave me it gave me a language. And so what I wanted to do in terms of the book was to do to give a Latin which to this incredible struggle that so many of us that we would sit and talk about it. I mean, we would we you know, we talk to each other about the cultural differences and the problems that we were facing. But there weren't. It wasn't getting translated because here's the thing: the notion of biculturalism. Every single author up to that time who even mentioned anything that might remotely be bicultural, in a sense, in the way that I'm talking about it, dominant, supported relationships, were all of color. So you look at Du Bois's work, you look at Fanon, you look, you know, they, they use different terms, but what, that's what they're talking about, white mass, black mass, I mean, they're talking about that conflict that has to then get resolved in order to make some sense of the world and to find a place of empowerment. So in Freire's work, it was how do we then create the conditions within the classroom, despite these differences, 
that can allow the process of empowerment to take place. Now, the interesting thing is how much of Thady's work has been appropriated and unfortunately appropriated badly uh, in the sense that they take the notion of dialogue and then suddenly dialogue becomes this kind of formula or this kind of, you know, kind of, you know, it gets stripped of, of, of dialogue in the, in the revolutionary sense that was about the reconstruction and, and, and transformation of consciousness. Or, you know, that there are the ways of, of thinking about, oh, I was going somewhere with it, but I just lost it. So <laughs> this is the thing about being 61. You know, you, you just like, all of a sudden, like, what the heck was I going to say? <laughs> I, I, I don't find it again. <laughs> But, you know, what I'm trying to say here is that, that, in a sense, trying to give a theoretical lens to very real conditions of oppression were what the impetus of the book were about. And actually, it's the impetus of my entire life, the impetus of my work as a scholar. And I tell you that I have paid dearly, I have suffered dearly for continuing to speak about these issues and struggle around these issues, and yet fundamentally, because they are in fact what I experience, what I see people experiencing, what I see people struggling with in different ways, and because there's this way of trying to allow a kind of fluid fluidity in the understanding of these questions and our ability then to think, what does it mean historically? How has this experience changed over the last 20 years? In what ways do we have to rethink, for example, social movement, social struggle? And, and one of the, the biggest things that I can tell you at this very moment in my life is that what I am struggling to bring this work to a, a, a place that helps me to understand that on one hand we struggle in terms of the cultural integrity of our histories, of you know the context in which we live, in terms of, of that which allows us to feel firmly planted and firmly here in the world. And at the same time, we've got to dialectically find that place where we are one. I mean, that's our challenge, and it's very, very difficult to do it in a positivist perspective because it demands that you dichotomize. And so for me, within the critical perspective, what it does is it helps me to realize that there is a fluidity that we are capable of, that differences do not have to break or undo our capacity to feel a sense of empathy as universal human beings. But in order to be able to do that, we must respect the particularities of the differences in which people have survived. Very dif you know, great differences as a consequence of the social and material conditions that people have had to contend with in their lives. And that as a consequence, how children are schooled is so tied to their class position. And there's a way in which we don't look at that. You know, people will say, well, what do kids need? What do these kids need? And one of the frustrating things for me at times is a feeling like, these children are human. <laughs> you know, they need the same mobility that some of those, you know, more affluent kids get. They need, they need more, um, you know, more uh, stimulating opportunities like the affluent kids get, you know? They need more, more opportunities to really drive their teaching in the way that, you know, I mean, what are the, the, the kinds of things that, that affluent schools say, oh, you know, they have more adults to the kids. I mean, we know that, that there's no way that you should have, you know, an adult with 20 kids, let alone with 30 kids. I mean, that is just ridiculous. Anybody who has kids knows this. In fact, most people who have kids don't want to be around 20 kids, let alone 30 kids. And yet they throw young teachers in there. You know, there's a need at this time, and I'm going to stop here. I really fundamentally believe that there is a need for a transformation of consciousness 
in our understanding of our humanity, our understanding of how we come to honor the universal dimensions of who we are, how we fight together, but that we cannot do that without deep respect for how people come to the table and how they explain and how they struggle with their own experience. And so for me, it's all about how we come to do that. You know, and it's not about coming up with a formula for it. It's about understanding that the only way we can do this is we have to do it in vivo. We've got to stop looking for the model, the perfect model. I mean, look at, you know, anyway, we've got to start really engaging one another, engaging our students in ways that demand their presence, but that also demand our presence. And I promise you that it seems to me that when we do that, we bring a sense of life, not just talking about it, but a, a life that is being and present, and that allows them transformation to just be an everyday common reality of what is our lives and, and who we are and how we teach. Okay, so I'll stop there and I'll... I don't even know how long I went, but I think it probably went longer than I wanted to. I'm sorry. I just kind of like with. <laughs> so, questions? Yeah. What happened when you were 20? I'm sorry? What happened to you when you were 20 then uh, with the three kids that made you... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I ended up at community college. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> I am, I am a, a believer of community college. I went to community college, and I'll tell you there, I had the great fortune to meet a A.P. Gonzalez, who is now a filmmaker who teaches at UCLA, but he was my English teacher. And I mean, t t in terms of how we can, we can change our students' lives, we don't even realize the power that we have as educators. But I remember I, I did a, this film class, at, the film is literature, you know, and, it, and, it, and, and I did this paper, and he gives me back this paper, and it has like A++, plus plus and, and I had never been given that kind I mean, I mean, it was, it was just, you know, fun to me. <laughs> so I went to talk to him, and I, I and, um, and he, he, he it, it was like he affirmed me. You know, he affirmed my intellectual capacity in a way that had never quite, you know, as an adult, young adult, been affirmed. And he said to me, I don't know what you're going to do, but whatever you got to do, you, you got to stay in school. You got to find a way to, to, bring, to bring yourself to the world. And now, you know, now we're friends. I mean, we, we've been friends. I, that's one thing, I keep in touch with people. Some people <laughs> can't stand it because I don't let them go. <laughs> I think I know, I know all of the, I, I've graduated probably almost 125 um, doctoral students and I'm, I'm in touch with all of them. <laughs> but, you know, so that was really important. So there, then later I went to Pacific Oaks and when I went to Pacific Oaks, I have just been, you know, I, I just, just by, the, by grace, I mean truly grace, there was a woman named Carol Phillips, and Carol ended up being the director of the National Child Black Institute in Washington. But Carol introduced me to, to the notion of culture and issues of power in, in, in her work, um, and helped me to begin to understand that it wasn't that there was something wrong with me. <laughs> you know, I mean, sometimes I didn't understand how people made sense of things. You know, I, I remember at that time, my big thing, and they don't laugh. <laughs> it was, I couldn't understand, like, people needed space. Mm. Like they needed space. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I'm sorry. I, I get it now. <laughs> I, I've become thoroughly bicultural. <laughs> I did not get it, because I didn't grow up with any of that stuff. I mean, you, you know, we had little rooms. I'd be like, where the heck were you going to go? You know, space. <laughs> and so we, we, we would talk about little things like that. And so she helped me to begin to think about that and to begin to reflect on my life, which, of course, for those of you that know Paulo Freire's work, so much of it is about learning to be reflective about our life, not just our work, but our, our life, who we are and how we are in the world. And so from there, 
I, I eventually became a therapist, did a lot of work in child abuse, domestic violence. That was a big area of my work. Um, and, and then ended up at Claremont after working, doing a lot of community organizing and, and, um, and went to Claremont. They didn't know what the hell I was talking about at the time. <laughs> there was nobody there that knew. I mean, it was terrible. I had a, a doctoral committee that I would call the, a, a sympathetic doctoral committee, except for Henry Giroux, who kicked my ass, <laughs> who was supposed to be my friend. <laughs> but, but, I mean, they were sympathetic in the sense that I think that they, they had some faith in maybe that I had some, you know, that there was something... I think. <laughs> but they were never quite sure, <laughs> except that I was able to talk about it pretty well. So they, you know. But they were at least good, good enough to me that they, you know, that they supported me. And so that, that's been my, my, the trajectory of my life. I never started out to be uh, a professor. I never would have even believed 30 years ago that I would be a professor. It, wasn't, it, wasn't not, it was not a careerist thing. I don't believe, I, I think there's something very wrong when they, when they strip us of the sense that our lives might have meaning beyond the way they're defined by others. And I just know that thank goodness, for whatever reason, I had good people in my life. And they, you know, that, that support. And so when I support my students and I support colleagues and I support others, it comes more from that gratitude. You know, that sense that I know there would have been no way in hell that that poor Vario kid could have done what I'd been able to do if there weren't a lot of people in my life who in some way or another, you know, provided that. Do you think um, a lot of this came out of the 70s and 80s when there was a lot yeah. of social problems? Yes. And how do you think a young woman today would respond yeah. to I, Yeah, I mean, that is one of my greatest concerns about what is happening these days. Because I, I think that it was a historical moment that allowed a number of us to get through in this way. Not a whole lot, but there were a number of us that got through. I think that what has happened as a consequence is that in a lot of ways, particularly graduate education, that education in general, has become more, you know, more controlling, more controlled. Professors in a lot of ways, they have the whole notion of, of, of academic freedom well, it doesn't mean a whole lot if after a while the only way you can be legitimate is that you're teaching particular ways or particular, you know, <laughs> particular subjects and particular and specific. You know, there's something gets lost. But I think it, it, it is all related to the, the impact that opening that space for more women and folks of color, working class folks, to come into the academy. And, let, and you know, as we see, particularly in these times, we see some very, very interesting things happen in terms of how the academy has become, in, in many ways, instrumentalized. And that part of our struggle is how do we keep it humanized? I and mean, we know that there's a move to do away with the humanities. Mm -hmm. As if STEM, you know, science, technology, now, engineering, like they were going to save our life. <laughs> but that was good. That, that, that's the answer to everything. I don't believe. I believe that that's very wrong-minded. And that we need to we need to continue to struggle for spaces within the academy and spaces within schools and education where children really explore their humanity and who they are. Did you have access growing up in East LA? Did you have access to libraries? And did they have did children's <laughs> literature have an impact. There was a film that I saw. The library at UCLA. was a baby city. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. I, I always said, you know, I, you, <laughs> my mom would walk us to the library. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and they would have like a little big, it was still, yeah. they, even then they had right. little story hours. Yeah. You know, I, I also remember there used to be like a toy loan. Mm -hmm. We'd have yeah. toys, they'd have a little toy loan, and you take, you know, you take your little toy and, mm -hmm. and then make sure to bring it back. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. yeah. But yeah, the the li library, yeah. I mean, I have a very, you know, incredible love for libraries, mm -hmm. and I, I don't see quite that same relationship uh, with my grandkids, my mm -hmm. grandgirls, but I try to take them to the library anyway. You know? <laughs> okay. The, the movement in, in the Los Angeles Unified School District to defund 
library personnel. Mm -hmm. It's just, I know. I think that's yeah. systemically disastrous yeah. for society. Yeah. Uh, you know. And then you have all these people who think that technology is going to save it all. And I keep thinking, oh gosh, when's, it, when's the majority of stuff is in, in, you know, in those memory banks? And let's just hope we don't have some kind of major blackout and we lose everything. <laughs> I think, I think I'm, I'm, I kind of like the old school holding my book in my hand. I mean, there are many ways to read, and, yeah, and that's exactly. all great. Yeah. But you, it doesn't matter how you're getting your information yeah. or your literature recommendations. You need the guidance of a professional. You would like the story. I, I only own three books. And they were the books that, one book was an old woman who took a liking to me when I was a, a child in, in one of the apartments and knew that had a really rough life. She gave me Pollyanna. <laughs> but you know, it's actually this really thick book, yeah. right? Pollyanna. And then when I went to uh, the St. Vincent's de Paul, you know, mm -hmm. society thing, because that's where we go to buy clothes and stuff, I found this Trixie Belden book, yeah. mystery yeah. book for five cents, and then The Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. So for about four years, five years in my life, those were my own books. And you know, they probably shaped some of my <laughs> ways in ways that I don't even realize. You know. But um, but they were important to me because they were the only books I had, and and really I did live. It was really a hard life. My mom was an alcoholic. She was schizophrenic. She had to be hospitalized numerous times. The 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 weight of the pressure really. You know, there was not a lot of resources. And it was really a hard life. I was the oldest kid. I, there was only two of us, but I was the oldest, and a lot of responsibility was placed on me. And so the consequence is that, you know, I mean, it's, the human beings are incredible to me. <laughs> you know, like, we will find a way to survive. It, it's like, and so for my way of surviving was those three books, mm -hmm. those three little crazy books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they, they, you know, they gave me a place to escape to. Um, I just think that, that what makes me sad is that we live in a world where people who have children are not supported, were not supported then and even now are not supported sufficiently in order to be able to take care of their kids and, 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 and themselves, especially, you know, I'm talking about people who live in horrendous poverty. And, you know, so, I mean, I, I just... You know, I, my mom died about 13 years ago, and, um, and she mellowed as she got older, you know, but I try to take that in now only as an example of, you know, the, kinds of, the kind of world that I want to help create and that I want to be a part of is a world that doesn't allow that to continue to happen in children's lives and in the lives of young adults who are struggling to survive. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else before we stop? Good. Your 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 llenos. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So. Thank you.